Well, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar today with the, where we're looking at food security in the UAE, um, challenges and opportunities. Um, and first of all, I'd like to um, welcome our speakers that are here today and yourselves as attendees. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping to begin. We're going to be recording the session, so please be aware that we're going to record this event in its entirety. If you've got any questions for the question and answer session, please do put them in the chat and we will um, be um, looking at those as we go through the session. We're going to have a series of presentations, um, the first one being from Her Excellency uh, Mariam Al Al Maheri, Minister of State for Food and Water Security at the United Arab Emirates. So I'd really like to welcome her today. We will then have a presentation from um, Dr. Banu Chowdhury, where we're going to look at the role of education in delivering food security. And our third presentation will be from Tariq Sanad, Finance Officer of the Pure Harvest Smart Farms um, from Abu Dhabi, who's going to be looking at the essential aspect to the role of controlled environment agriculture in delivering food security. So before we look at um, uh, and we hand over to look at the uh, presentations in general, um, I'm just going to share um, a short video, which is an opening welcome from our um, Vice Chancellor at the Royal Agricultural University, um, Professor Joe Price. It gives me great pleasure to welcome the speakers and members of the audience to this first joint interactive webinar between the Royal Agricultural University and the United Arab Emirates. The focus of the webinar is how to address the challenge of food security in the UAE. Here at the Royal Agricultural University, we pride ourselves on our thought leadership and for focusing on the pressing issues facing those who have to produce food and manage the land. The impact of the global pandemic has highlighted how global supply chains can be vulnerable to environmental and societal shocks, and also how connected we are as a global community. I would like to thank the government of the UAE for working with us to develop the panel of very knowledgeable speakers that we have with us today, and especially Her Excellency, Mariam Bint Mohammed Sahid Hareb Al Al Hayri, Minister of State for Food and Water Security, for her valuable contribution today. We look forward very much to the conversation and listening to the ideas and innovations that will be proposed to address this pressing issue of how the UAE can feed its people in a sustainable way. Okay, so thank you very much to our Vice-Chancellor for her introduction and also highlighting the real challenge we have in many parts of the world with both water and food security. So it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker this afternoon, Her Excellency Mariam um, Al Meheri, um, who um, has a wealth of knowledge and experience in this area. So I'm going to hand over now and really look forward to the talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you to all of you at the Royal Agricultural University. Really, it's, it's an honor for me to be here with you today. Thank you for your time. And it's really unbelievable when you see how uh, your university has been at the forefront and is at the forefront of agriculture already since 170 years or over 170 years. So, so uh, uh, I really applaud all of you for your efforts in this. So it's, it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. Now, I just wanna give you a little bit of a, a background to who UAE or what UAE is. So United Arab Emirates um, comprises of seven emirates. Uh, the area of the United Arab Emirates is about 84,000 square um, kilometer and we have just over 9 million uh, people living here. We have over 200 nationalities living here in the UAE so as you can imagine 
many cultures, many, many uh, people coming with different uh, foods, uh, favorites and tastes. So we're really a melting pot of cultures and, and um, food tastes. So the UAE really from the start has been um, uh, a country that in many, many or over many, many years has been a hub for food trade because we are a water scarce country, because we don't have, uh, we have less than 5% agricultural land. Um, we really built our food security on food trade. Um, and, but we know also in the next coming years and with the global challenges that we're facing today that uh, we do have to change in order to increase our resilience when it comes to food security. So we've prepared a few slides for all of you today, just to give you some, some visuals of of our journey so far in the food security file. I was appointed as Minister of State for Food Security in 2017. And uh, since then, there's quite a few things that we have achieved so far and uh, many things that I'll be talking about during this presentation and also telling you a little bit about where we hope to uh, get to in the future as well. So, here, the first slide is just to tell you all what is food security. So food security is really enabling all citizens and res residents of a country to have access to safe, sufficient and nutritious food for an active and healthy lifestyle at affordable prices at all times, including emergencies and crises. Next slide, please. Lisa. So why is food security a global issue? Um, I think all of you are familiar with with these issues, population is on the rise and as population grows, food demand grows. We know we've heard of uh, the, the forecasts of us heading towards 10 billion by 2050, uh, but agriculture as it is now, uh, won't be able to keep up with that food demand if it continues on this course. So we have to change our methods to be able to close that food gap. Uh, climate change, sorry, not yet, but climate change is also um, making it much more difficult for us to produce food. Uh, water depletion is ha happening in so many uh, areas around the world. The UAE is a water scarce country, so we know exactly what this means when you don't have water. You always have to think about the food, energy, water nexus, um, when you're thinking about growing food or the whole supply chain. Um, and then of course, uh, food and um, food loss and food waste, which is something that is, comes down to our behavior. So if we go to the next slide. We're actually always talking about disrupting the food systems. The way our food systems are now um, is it's not sustainable and we need to change um, uh, how we produce food and how we consume food because it really is, and I, I'm sure all of you know this, it's not new to you. We have enough food for everyone but the food is not reaching everybody. Uh, there are still over 800 million people um, hungry um, or going to bed every night without any food. Uh, we still ha we ha we're having a rise in obesity rates. So this is the other extreme where it's not the right foods uh, that people are eating. So we have, we have issues in our food systems. And as we are all working towards the SDGs, we need to always think of the two things, which is production and the consumption as well. So our behavior also has a huge role on the food security domain. Go to the next slide, Lisa. Um, so when I was appointed minister in 2017, His Highness said to me three things. He said, Mariam, you need to focus on a plan. You need to focus on technology and you need to focus on advancing R&D. So that's what we did. We started off with the plan. And this is where the national food security strategy um, was developed with all the stakeholders. So this is in a nutshell what it is. Uh, we kind of formalized it in a nice um, sim symbol of, of, of food, a symbol of wheat to symbolize food. And here we have the five strategic directions. We're looking at how we can enhance and facilitate agribusiness. The UAE, as you know, is a hub for food trade. Uh, we import more than 90% of our food and, uh, but in, in future, we still want to import a lot of food, but we just don't want to be dependent on the net imports as much as we are now. Um, number two is about enhancing uh, sustainable 
or enhancing domestic production using technology. The third strategic pillar is really looking at reducing food loss and food waste. This is a pillar on its own because it has such importance. Uh, number four, sustaining food safety and ensuring we're um, enhancing the nutritional intake. Uh, I was having a brief talk with, with Louise just now as well. So we're, we're not just talking about food security, but nutrition security as well. Um, this will become more and more important. And then number five, it's about enhancing our capacity uh, for our emergency preparedness. And believe me, this strategic direction with its programs really got tested last year. Okay, let's go to the next slide. As with any strategy, you have the strategic objectives or directions and you've got the enablers. And the enablers here are having a, a governance model, the R&D agenda, um, a sound database, human capacity, and we call this the food movement. And basically what it is, it's, it's not your typical campaign. It's more of how we can nudge and move behavior change. Because as you know, in every culture, you've got enshrined behavior um, around, around food and food very much is in the heart of so many cultures. And um, for example, in the UAE, we, we love inviting guests and, and showing a diverse um, area of dishes uh, that we want to ask the guests to try. Um, and this, this behavior we know is not sustainable. So we really have to think of with the new generation now, how we can sort of even, it's still polite to offer fewer dishes and think of enjoying it until it's actually finished. Because having a dish that finishes is usually not considered polite, but we have to change this behavior. And that's why we're calling it the food movement because it's all about changing behavior. And this, this, this takes time, of course. So, uh, so this is in a nutshell, the, the strategy, the National Food Security Strategy of the UAE. And of course, when you have a strategy, you also need a governance model. Now, our governance model here is we have so many ministries and local authorities and each of them play uh, or are responsible for certain aspects of food security. For example, the Ministry of Economy is in charge of the uh, prices of, co of commodities uh, here in the UAE. Then there's the Ministry of Health who's in charge of the uh, nutritional aspect. Then there's the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment who are in charge of the farmers. So every ministry or authority has a part to play. So we had to form a governor's model, model to be able to communicate and be able to align with each other. So we established in 2019 the Emirates Food Security Council, which I'm honored to be leading. Uh, there are 16 members in total. Um, and as I mentioned before, the UAE is made up of the seven emirates. So we also have a representative of each of the local um, emirates as part of this council. And this is where we discuss all matters related to food. So um, it's really a, a, a place to talk about uh, laws, regulations, bottlenecks we have, um, and how we can also, in a way, change the blueprint of the country in order to build uh, um, our resilience and go more towards sustainable food systems. So adopting technology, which was the direction, the second direction that His Highness gave me, um, we really put a lot of effort to, uh, to work with the private sector, academia, to be able to look at what are the bottlenecks of uh, why we are not seeing so much ag tech in the UAE as we'd like to see. Why hasn't this picked up at a more faster pace? Um, so we used something called the Government Accelerator Program. And with this, we brought about 100 people from the different uh, authorities, private sector. And we worked on a whole set of, it was about 10 uh, bottlenecks or challenges. And with this, we came out with, set, with 10 new initiatives that we launched with His Highness um, in really, let's say, launching a new economic sector, which we like to call ag tech. And um, with this came things like we, we now had, remember, I, I mentioned to you, UAE has or is a food trade hub and agriculture. Uh, you don't see agriculture in large scale as you would do in, in your country, for example, or many other food producing countries. So so for us to, to launch this, this new sector, we had to really uh, 
un make sure that the people understand that this is this is a, a a mindset change that agriculture is no longer your traditional open farm system, but that there are now your CEAs, uh, your RAS systems um, that can really use technology and can be used in the middle of the cities. Uh, it can be used on, on uh, non-farmable land to be able to actually grow food. And so with this, we had to launch a new uh, license uh, or license framework. We also launched the Emirates Sustainable Agriculture label. Uh, we put out aquacultural standards. We have now an aquaculture atlas, which shows you the zones of where you can do different practices in aquaculture. Also, AgTech building codes, for example, this wasn't here before, but now with the CEAs, the um, Controlled Environment Ag, uh, we wanted to make sure that if somebody uh, goes into the area of ag tech, that they have a set of standards that they can follow. And um, also the other initiatives, as you see here on the slide. So this was really the beginning of us uh, introducing to the UAE that we really want to go down the road of ag tech. And um, I mean, you'll see later on, um, uh, we have Tarek from Pure Harvest is here, and he'll talk a little bit about from the perspective of a private sector entity in ag tech and what they've experienced here in the UAE. So these are just to show you some examples, and I'm sure you're all aware of these, these new forms of, of ag tech. And this is really the UAE wants to see these kind of uh, facilities developing here in the UAE. So advancing R&D uh, is another area that His Highness had really pushed me to, uh, to make sure that we take big steps in. We have R&D facilities here in the UAE. We have the International Center for Biosal and Agriculture, which is also known as ICBA. Um, you'll see here the Seawater Innovation Center. This basically is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a facility, it's a two hectare plot. And it basically uses something that I call the three S's. We've got the sun, we've got the sea, and we've got the sand. So this is all powered by solar energy. And you've got open ponds with seawater that, that is growing your protein, so fish and shrimp. The wastewater from that is going into a halophyte uh, bed, which is then producing your biofuel. And then the wastewater further goes into mangrove swamps and then gets recirculated back to the fish and shrimp. And this is really um, a great, uh, let's say, project that says, okay, we're producing high value protein, we're producing biofuel. And um, with this also powered by the sun and being able to grow all this in, in a desert landscape. Um, this was uh, a successful project, which is now being um, scaled up. It's now two hectares. I think they're taking it to 20 hectare now. And the biofuel, which was produced here on the site was actually used in Etihad Airways um, and on the flight from Abu Dhabi to, uh, to Amsterdam. So uh, this, this project also has some great insights on, of how we can grow proteins in desert landscapes. And then on the right side, the Marine Innovation Park, this is uh, a park in the making um, and basically will catalyze the blue economy here in, in the region. So when you're looking at food security uh, on uh, sea-based and uh, also the pharma industry as well. Next slide, please. Um, this is just to show you some of the um, uh, announcements made here in the UAE, uh, which shows that we're really taking steps now in, in um, spendings and research and development. So the Abu Dhabi uh, Investment Office, uh, just in the last uh, 12 months, I mean, these announcements were made in April last year, and, and I think this was November last year. So a total sum of about $140 million has been spent on multiple uh, ag tech companies, one of them being also Pure Harvest, um, and really helping them um, yeah, enhance their R&D um, abilities. Um, here, I just want to start going into a few of the initiatives of, of our office. Uh, we are a strategic office here in the UAE, and um, it's, it's really about us thinking of strategic projects which the country needs in order to go into the changes we'd like to go into. So. Our aim is really um, going, becoming a hub also for technology and innovation. 
um, in in food security and in doing so we need to build that that uh, knowledge-based economy as well uh, so technology and innovation is key research and development is key but also building human capacity etc so all these initiatives that you're going to see now we launched with our strategic partners in order to help us push in the direction we'd like to go to. So this is uh, the National Nutritional Guideline, um, as with the UK and with many other countries, it's really important that we guide the community on what foods they should be eating on a macro and on a micro level. And every um, environment is a little bit different. So in this National uh, Nutritional Guideline, we're guiding all the different age groups on what they should be eating and some of the foods that we have here in the region as well to kind of move them also towards a more sustainable nutritional guideline. We also uh, launched the nutritional labeling policy. Um, this is going to become mandatory in uh, so far January 2022. And uh, this, I think, I believe is similar to the UK system. It's the traffic light system to help uh, citizens be able to choose uh, their foods um, in a more, um, yeah, in a more educative way. I mean, not, not everyone understands uh, if a food has two grams of sugar, is this a lot for me or is this not a lot for me? Not all of us are new nutritionists here. So it's really good to have a guideline to help them uh, make better choices when, when going to the supermarket or elsewhere. We also launched the Food Tech Challenge for us, it's all about really getting the community and also the youth excited about ag tech in general and what technologies are out there. Um, I always think that when there is challenges, there's also a whole bunch of opportunities. And so with Food Tech Challenge, um, we were able to attract, I think we had over 400 su submissions from about 70 different countries. Um, the total prize money was $1 million. So we had uh, four winners, as you can see them here. And um, all four winners are now in a way incubated and are uh, scaling up to hopefully then see them on a commercial scale um, in, in the coming years. So, so we're really excited about that. Uh, this is the food research platform. Again, trying to strategically align the research efforts that are being done in the UAE um, as, as in most places, whenever research is done, you see a lot of people doing this in silos. And here we're trying to sort of bring in all the, the universities, the institutes, the governments to say, okay, anyone who's doing um, uh, research in certain fields, if they could put all their information and data in one place, then people can, um, can find it more easily and can also understand what's happening and we kind of avoid the duplication as well. The UAE Aquacultural Pulse was something we also issued last year. We, we noticed because we're starting to grow the aquacultural sector in the UAE. Globally, as you know, aquaculture covers, I think, more than 50% of the fish demand. Here in the UAE, aquaculture covers just under 3% of the fish demand in the UAE. So there's a lot of potential for aquaculture to grow. We've also invested um, so far over 200 million dirhams um, in uh, hatcheries and fish farms in the UAE to try and really catalyze uh, this, this sector moving forward. And so we noticed that something that was missing was a kind of guideline for investors to understand the aquaculture landscape in the UAE. And that's why we issued the UAE Aquaculture Pulse 2020 to help investors understand where are the hatcheries, what are the fish types that people uh, are or are that are in, in high demand? What are the prices that are in the markets? Um, so this was something we issued. Then of course, COVID-19 came and changed the world. And, um, but what I have to say is we're so blessed here in the UAE with the leadership that we have. It's, it's like they have foresight in their DNA um, to, nominate a minister in charge of food security, ensure that there was a strategy in place, ensure there was a governance model in place. And this all happened before COVID-19 um, hit the world. And suddenly when we were in the middle of the pandemic, the planes halted. And as you can imagine, we were, we're importing 90% of our food. So 
for us, this was a real like, oh, uh, alarm bells. And um, but because we had the governance in place and we had the plan in place, we were able to maneuver quite well. And um, for those that are living here in the UAE, um, no one actually saw any shelves um, empty of any main food items here. So I, I really can say it was the leadership, um, our great relations with, with so many countries. Um, it was having the plan, the governance model that really helped us maneuver through these, these challenging times. And, and we did, we had, just because we were also in touch with all the right stakeholders, we knew what was happening in the background. So I'll give you an example. With one of our neighboring countries, usually there was a certain entry point where we'd be getting fish every day, a certain amount of kilograms of fish. And suddenly one day we had no fish coming in, second day, no fish coming in. And then on the third, fourth day, we, con we connected with that country and we asked what was wrong. And it was because of COVID related issues that it wasn't coming in. So for us, it was really a lot of work that we had to do in the background, um, a lot of, uh, let's say, sleepless nights, uh, but really all the stakeholders working together, the private sector having also options A, B, C in, in place. I mean, we used repatriation flights to bring goods to the UAE. Um, we removed things that we could see were barriers. For example, the Arabic label on foods was, uh, was then temporarily removed because this was not a food safety aspect. So we didn't want to um, burden the food flow with, with more um, tasks or, or putting the, the label on. We also you know, reached out to diplomatic uh, missions across the world to ensure that if there were any restrictions in that country, uh, if we could have some discussions with them on how to maneuver uh, certain food items. So there was a lot happening in the background. And um, I can really say going through the pandemic, I mean, the lessons learned through this were, were immense. And um, I think for many people in the world, uh, I mean, food security now, the subject of food security has become mainstream. And I feel this is now the train we all need to jump on to start moving into more sustainable food systems. Governments are now more, um, more ready to take on or spend more money in this, in this field. So I, I believe COVID has really, or is giving us an opportunity uh, to, to try and reach the SDG goals that we have by 2030, but really to, to try and catalyze all the efforts we're doing now to move into more sustainable uh, food systems. I feel people's attitudes towards food has changed. I mean, being in lockdown, having to cook more meals at home and not going out so much, not spending so much money, um, all these aspects, um, I feel, have changed also the behavior and the attitude that the people have towards food. Uh, just in my family, uh, there were three, three people that have started growing foods here, um, cucumbers, tomatoes, so those the perishable foods, and, and they, they love it. I think it gives them, it's not, not just about actually having food, but the actual activity of, of growing food, um, I think, has or helps them also um, emotionally and, and uh, just being away from, from, from their loved ones for so long that they have an activity to, to do and that something sprouts from, from, from what they're doing. Um, so uh, I believe COVID has brought us a lot of opportunities. Um, we had um, the, the cabinet issued a decree and said, uh, Mariam, we need to develop an ag tech sector development team um, with this, we uh, reached out to, to uh, all the private sector entities in the ag tech field, so be it livestock, fish farming, uh, horticulture, and, um, and really looked at how we can speed up local production. Um, as you probably see from all the, the restrictions that happen, many countries have started to look into how we can increase uh, local production and uh, for countries such as ourselves, technology and innovation really is key. So looking at the ag tech sector was really important. And we, we kind of, in this team, developed the whole list of, let's say, uh, interventions that the government must do to change the blueprint of the country when it comes to, to ag tech. So in a way, the work we had done in the accelerator two years back 
was now enhanced with this team's efforts. And we're now in the process to discuss this with the cabinet now to hopefully um, uh, launch some of these, uh, um, let's say, interventions to help the ag tech sector. One of the newest announcements uh, is the Food Tech Valley, which was announced uh, two weeks ago. And um, really, this is, this is a dream come true in a way. Um, being um, in this position now since 2017, I've always said um, we, we kind of need a playground. We need a playground to bring um, the right mindsets uh, of people, the technologies, the, um, and, and, and have this, this playground to, or this, this global laboratory to, to test and try these new technologies of how to grow food more sustainably in harsh environments such as the UAE. So um, Food Tech Valley is now in the making and um, this is where we hope to also attract a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, SMEs, um, and also the community to come and try these, these future clean uh, tech-based foods as well. So cellular agriculture is also something I'm sure you you all know about, and we feel that this would be a, a great hub to to discover and explore the sector more um, in, in our region. So this is in a nutshell about what the UAE has been doing and uh, where we really want to go is we want to become um, a hub for um, innovation-driven food security. And uh, with that, Thank you very much, Louise. I hope I didn't extend my time there. <laughs> thank you. Not at all. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving us um, an overview and an insight into all the activities at the UAE and also uh, that real mix between public and private partnerships, which um, is we're looking at technology as well, is so key to um, food security. So thank you um, for the first presentation. And I'm sure that will engender lots of questions. So please do put your questions in the chat and we're going to come back to them after the other two presentations. So I'm now going to turn to um, Dr. Chowdhury, who is Dean at the College of Food and Agriculture at the UAE University. Dr. Chowdhury has worked right across the world um, in a range of roles within education. And um, has a passion for um, education and agriculture that's linked to um, technology. So um, Dr. Chowdhury is going to speak to us about the role of education in delivering food security. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a, a great privilege to be here sharing uh, uh, this stage together with a bunch of dignitaries uh, especially Her Excellency uh, Maria Malmari, who has, through her presentation, shown that uh, UAE has progressed immensely, especially during the last few years in the area of food security, uh, to the extent that we over here aspire to be number one in food security index during the coming years by 2050. So, that is ambitious, that is aspirational, but as you might have seen in many of the things that we have achieved over here, we do get things done over here. One of the things which she mentioned toward the end of, of her talk was regarding the Food Tech Valley. Uh, and uh, this announcement has really tickled me uh, so much that uh, I, I became the person that I am the person who will be coordinating efforts to supply people who will be working in this, the future experts, the future leaders, the future thinkers. So the role of UAE University and the College of Food and Agriculture becomes extremely, extremely important to make sure that the goals and the vision which the leadership is providing to the nation, we from our side, from the college side, from the university side are indeed able to fulfill them. We take pride that we are the only college of food, agriculture, as well as veterinary medicine in the country. So while taking pride, we do understand we have got a huge responsibility to play uh, as we see these developments coming up. 
So from my side, I, I would like to briefly talk about uh, education and its role in, in, uh, in future of food security. Now we all know that education is the backbone of creating future leaders and thinkers. And its role is vital, it's critical, and no doubt it is foundational. Education can be at the level of creating graduates, and education can also be at the level of creating awareness among the community. And my primary focus in this presentation will be on creating graduates and experts who will become future torch bearers of various aspects that strengthen the future of food security in the country as well as globally. Now it becomes critical that we produce creative thinkers and problem solvers of the challenges posed by core questions around food security, then simply creating people who get worse by the topics and get a graduate degree. So there's a huge difference between the two things. And my goal in the college is to create the former. And this is actually the goal that is practiced globally too. Also, we want to make sure that from day one, these graduates, they employ a multidisciplinary approach than a boxed discipline based approach in their understanding. In today's world, agriculture and food production are very different than they used to be 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Today, it is an admixture of plant sciences, animal sciences, environment, climate, engineering, IT, business, entrepreneurship, supply chain, artificial intelligence, robotics, and I can go on and on and on. So today what we have is a, 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 a landscape that requires knowledge in multi-disciplines so that people can practice agriculture and then contribute to food security. Now, how do we create such graduates? How do we create such leaders? How do we create such thinkers? As an educator, my vision is very straightforward. We simply expose our youngsters to the best cutting edge and top notch learning environment that mimics, and I would like to emphasize over here, that, that mimics the current status of industry and at the same time pushes these learners to become creators of solutions for the future. That's what we need. Thus, to cater to that, we need a vibrant R&D ecosystem, which will be critical with state-of-the-art labs and world-class experts who share their knowledge with the students and allow them to blossom with their questions pertinent to the future and encourage them to find solutions. Such an ecosystem, if built around a thriving industry environment, then the graduates will succeed with leap and bounds and will automatically become key contributors for food security in the nation. And at the same time, they will become internationally competitive. Today's world is not local. Today's world is not regional either. Today's world is global. And we want to create leaders who are globally at the forefront of everything that we do. Most importantly, such an environment will give a new meaning to agriculture among the youth who are rather skeptical about the word agriculture. And this is not the case just here, but this is a global situation. Now we know what youth are tickled by. Technology tickles them. Technology excites them. And therefore, in my humble opinion, this is the frontier in agriculture that will attract them and that will make them the future leaders. Today, the youth takes food on the table or in the restaurant or in the grocery stores for granted simply because of its abundance. What we want to do is create an environment where while educating and training them, 
we also make them responsible and aware citizens, not just about food production, but about everything that influences food. Only then we can create future leaders and experts in the area of food production who are conscious, who are aware of the needs of the nation and also of the entire globe and humanity. With all the extraordinary developments taking place today to strengthen food security in UAE and around the world, leading agriculture and veterinary medicine institutions, while using a multidisciplinary approach, can contribute in a significant way to create individuals who can become the trailblazers of food security by becoming experts in disciplines that supported its advancement. At the College of Agriculture and Veterinary Medicine at UA University, this is our aspiration and this is our goal. We aim to contribute to the national goal of food security by creating the next wave of brain power who will advance and preserve food security through their expertise in different disciplines. Her Excellency has laid out a very ambitious plan and we at the college will be supporting it by creating these experts. So this is the vision I have for making sure that food security production can be met through expertise in the background. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. And you use lots of words we wouldn't necessarily associate with uh, veterinary graduates or agriculture graduates, such as being conscious and aware and understanding all the intricacies of um, the food security, food production and technology. And I think it's a very exciting time to be in education right now. Um, when we think of how agricultural education, food-based education, engineering is going to change over the next 20 years. I think it's an exciting time for young people and not so young people to come into the sector. Um, so thank you. Um, so I'm now going to um, turn to our third speaker today, um, Tariq Sanad, who is the Chief um, Financial um, Officer of Pure Harvest Smart Farms. And he is going to talk about um, specifically the controlled atmosphere environment farming and its role in delivering food security. So um, over to Tari. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Sorry, I was just on mute. Um, thank you. Uh, for uh, for you know having me uh, present uh, controlled environment agriculture and its role in in not just the UAE but you know on a on a global scale and the role it plays with regards to food security, um, it was a it was a pleasure talking uh, talking after uh, uh, Her Excellency the, um, Maria Mahari and uh, uh, Dr. Chowdhury as well, um, and we represent kind of the the opportunity and the capture of the opportunity that we see um, with uh, with from a from a private sector perspective um, and what we've been able to do here in the UAE over the, the course of the last three years with uh, quite ambitious expansion plans that we have um, with what we've learned um, in this uh, environment that we can you know uh, hopefully um, contribute to a lot of the aspirations that we we, we do have uh, as a nation. Now, kind of a little bit uh, further about you know pure, pure harvest smart farms, um, where we're, we are working uh, out of the UAE, out of uh, Al Ain in in Abu Dhabi, um, with one of the the, the first. Um, controlled environment smart smart farms that we've built here um, and we've built a pilot farm that is now proving a lot of the technologies and uh, and, and we've learned a lot from the R&D processes that we've that we've put into this farm that we're now expanding and continuing to build on its success um, with further grants that we've received to further enhance the the food security objective but also um, from a from a kind of financial perspective I think one of the things that we've learned is there's a contrarian thesis which I'll take you through into why actually this part of the world can 
become a, a considerable player in the food supply um, uh, globally as well. So um, I'll take you through a very quick what was the problem that we've tried to, to solve? Uh, we're, we're, in the, we're in the UAE, which is a harsh climate that has um, water scarcity that was quite mentioned. We've built a solution um, and you know, I'll, I'll take you through how that solution plays a big role um, in uh, the, the challenges that we face, not only in the UAE, but uh, globally with regards to food security and how we see our expansion plan and the future as well. Um, so going into the the, the problem and uh, um, is when we when we talk about food security, uh, we, we all know that the the food supply required is 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 quite stressed. Now, when we double click into where is that problem um, and Her Excellency mentioned like there is food available, right? But there is certain parts of the world where food is not available. And this is actually where we have quite a considerable amount of the population growth as well. So it's actually exasperated even further in, um, in, the, in the regions that you see on my screen here, where you see the red and, uh, and brown spots. Um, on top of that, we have climate, um, uh, you know, climate change making the situation worse and water scarcity. Um, and therefore, if we are to solve this problem, we do need to look into technology. Um, and we believe that, uh, you know, as, as being the champion of the sector, controlled environment agriculture has a massive role to play in enabling um, kind of food security uh, for um, uh, to solve this problem. So let's kind of focus a little bit where we are in the UAE and some of the macro and micro challenges that we've been facing. Um, we have a high food uh, import dependence. We have a fast growing population with the tourism um, and you know, GCC are kind of a more regional approach is, is growing at double the world averages in terms of people. On top of that, more people are wanting fresh, um, uh, high quality um, nutrient foods. Um, there is, uh, with, with the focus that a lot of governments are also doing on um, providing understanding with the, uh, the, the benefits of nutrients and also um, you know, handling obesity and so forth, there will be an increased demand behind fresh um, uh, fruit and vegetables. Um, in an in a, in a area where, where we actually have a, quite a considerable water scarcity um, uh, where it's, it wouldn't be sustainable um, uh, if we continue to extract the groundwater at the way that we, we do right now. Going into a bit more detail with our micro challenges, um, we do have um, extreme temperatures and humidity um, where we're shut down uh, from local supply for about five months of the year, which is our summer period versus our the winter period, which is very uh, um, easier to grow. Um, the, the, the domestic pro produce that was, um, and, and I think this is changing, but um, wasn't able to produce great tasting, high shelf life and the aesthetics that uh, the import product was able to, to provide. Um, and we see how the, the multiple of money on the on local versus imported is, is quite high um, with, uh, and, and therefore the, uh, the, the imported products was actually um, uh, being sold at quite excessive prices and can, uh, and therefore, again, unsustainable. So what we've done is provide a technology driven solution to these problems. And we've tested this uh, with our pilot facility um, that, we, that we started here in the UAE. And now I go into a little bit why we thought this was probably one of the best places to test our, uh, our, our, our thesis. Um, one, the, the, the most important input, um, and here we, you, you see we compare versus Holland, where uh, Holland is one of the second largest producers of food globally and is an exporter of food. Um, so we benchmark versus them, um, where here, um, one of the, the most important inputs is obviously light. Right, it is. Um, it, it it's a fundamental driver of your ability to to grow food, um, and we have an abundance of it, at double the light levels um, per square meter, uh, simply because of where we are situated. Uh, on top of that, um, 
uh, and and this goes to the you know the the the, the key cost inputs that are required for um, you know, controlled environment agriculture is uh, the the labor required where um, you know versus a, a Holland our labor costs are much lower um, and then. One of the third imports is the carbon dioxide. We're we're in a region where where uh, our our carbon dioxide emissions are you know nearly double global averages, and one of the key inputs to controlled environment agriculture and the growing of our food and vegetables is CO two, and we have that in abundance. We have very low tax rates, um, and we have commercial electricity that is um, cheaper than it is in you know further. Uh, places like like Holland. Where we do have a disadvantage um, is really the water resources, where water scarcity is a, a much more um, uh, much more uh, pressing issue in, in, in our part of the world. But um, uh, th this is where our solution versus uh, alternative solutions actually uh, provides a bit of a difference, where we use the seventh of the water, and I'll go into that a little bit more. Uh, as well. Now, we have an abundance of land, right? Um, there's a lot of non-arable uh, land um, and it's flat, which is the perfect environment for us um, to, to capture the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, versus uh, locations like Holland where land is not as easily uh, available. Um, we are going the local for local route um, and actually uh, we, we are eliminating the import and transportation costs where typically with controlled environment agriculture, you provide local for local and we can deliver um, within a, a radius of about a three hour drive to most cities um, in, 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 in where we operate. Um, there's a lot of uh, capital and support available um, for us. Um, as, as you have heard, there's numerous grants with regards to R&D availability and so forth that we're utilizing to further develop and enhance what we're doing here. Um, and population density here uh, simplifies the logistics that I was talking about, where we most of the populations are actually condensed in certain locations versus a disbursement across the different locations, enabling us to really serve this place. Um, from a commercial perspective, we have everything, um, which might be contrarian to, uh, to belief, but actually this is what we've been able to prove with our facility that we have uh, built here in the UAE. So what have we been able to produce in the, our controlled environment uh, facility is that one, we've been able to um, provide year round production um, this is something that is really, really important and goes towards the food security um, objective, where we are able to provide high quality food produced 365 days of the year, and especially uh, eliminate the, the, the issues that we have with our summer peak humi humidity and heat. We've been able to provide, due to the capture um, of the, the light, um, and which is the key input um, that we have here. We're able to, to produce 10 times the yields versus the low-tech farms available using a seventh of the water. Uh, of the water. Now, this enables us to provide affordable, and one of the things that we've been able to do is displace the imports by lowering the prices versus imports um, and provide clean healthy fresh produce which is protected by uh, nature and not chemicals so high quality at a lower price um, with uh, the utilization of less water right and 365 days a year is one of the the, the key things that has actually um, plays a big part in solving a lot of the the issues that were mentioned in the uh, in previous presentations with regards to food security um, and just to give you a bit of an idea, right? Like if we, if you look at the Holland, which we're we're learning a lot from, um, and bringing a lot of their technologies here and developing it to to address what we would like to address in our part of the world, right? Is we're taking this industrialization 
um, of uh, food um, and enabling food security by by adjusting that for what we what is required in very harsh climates like 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 we see here in the UAE and there's a lot of opportunity behind that. So. Um, a key thing that we've been able to do with controlled environment agriculture and its role is, uh, and this is where you see the purple marks are the, the, the temperatures that you have um, outside our facilities where you can see it can range anywhere between 46 degrees Celsius and sometimes even a, a bit too cold for the requirement around the, the, the 12 degrees Celsius mark. But we've been able to create a Mediterranean corridor where we can grow about anything. And this, again, emphasizes the, the importance that um, we, we can uh, adjust the climate to, to be able to, uh, to, to grow um, here in a region where, where um, the climate is, is quite harsh um, and uh, is more exacerbated by the water scarcity. Our vision is to deploy these growing systems globally, right? Um, we're in the UAE, which is within a four hours radius and about 2 billion people live um, here. Um, so uh, we're, we're really taking the, the thinking beyond just you know, solving for the UAE uh, and, and the GCC. And what we've been able to learn here is actually helping, um, uh, and, and this is the role that controlled environment agriculture has with regards to food security locally and also um, beyond its borders to really where it's uh, actually needed the most in growing populations that have, um, uh, you know, the exasperated problem that I shared in the, in the beginning of the presentation. Um, so a couple of um, powerful trends are converging, enabling us to to really think about and reshape our thinking about how and where we grow our food. So one of the things that we see is that commercialization of the, uh, of the agriculture, uh, our agriculture technologies enable us to uh, actually be more able to uh, uh, afford uh, building at a, at, at a bigger scale because with the growth you have the declining cost curves and the technology is advancing um, especially with relationships um, when it comes to the R&D grants that are you know driving that and this is where the policy of food and water security has been gaining strong momentum and more exacerbated by uh, COVID-19 um, enabling us to kind of unlock a lot more um, in our thinking of how and where to grow our food. Um, over and above that, um, there is a, there's a bigger market to capture, especially with consumer habits shifting towards clean, sustainable and local food uh, as a preference for consumers. Just to give you an idea of what we've been able to achieve here in the UAE, this is a couple of photos of um, uh, the produce that we actually grow, our pilot facility um, that is now even growing even further. We've been able to test over 30 varieties and grow you know, interesting varieties that we've been able to bring into the market that we're very, very proud of and actually commercialize and are available in the supermarkets here. On top of that, we're, we, uh, we started with tomatoes, which was a bellwether crop for us to be able to really understand if you can grow tomatoes, you can grow pretty much anything. Um, and we've cracked that with our pilot facility. We're now extending that into, as you can see here, uh, is, is actually one of our first strawberries that we've, we've been able to you know, uh, grow in, in our facilities. We're bringing in leafy greens and we now have even more, um, uh, you know, more products that we're, we're looking to bring into and bring, um, to, so not just thinking about it as, providing food security, but also food variety for the local population that would not be able to you know, have this due to the cost of the, the high cost of imports. Um, we, and just to kind of explain that here, you see that we, we've also brought this um, quite exotic yum tomato um, that is now grown here in the UAE. Um, it's, a, it's a very hard uh, one to grow, but we've been able to grow it within our facilities. Um, and it has actually a lot of nutritional benefits um, which uh, because of its uh, antioxidant uh, uh, um, uh, kind of construct, um, which is great for people with diabetes, et cetera. So 
not only have we been able to solve for food security, but we're also adding to the to the last step, which is the nutritional content um, with local produce uh, being able to be more affordable and accessing more consumers, right? Um, if, if Because we're bringing versus the imports uh, a 20 to 40% discount and actually lowering the prices by producing this. Um, seeing uh, with, with even retailers saying, once we've introduced our new segment, um, their, their, their categories have grown in the tomato sector because more consumers are able to afford better tasting food, um, which is you know, grown sustainably uh, through controlled environment agriculture. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, you've got me really excited now about tomatoes with anthocyanins in, so I could talk to you about that for a very long time, and um, nutrition through um, producing food that has a lot of nutritional benefits, which I think is really exciting. And so thank you so much for um, the presentation. So if people like to start to put questions in the Q&A, we have some already. So we've got some questions already in um, the Q&A, which I'll come to in a minute. And I'd like to open up now for our panel. Um, um, and I'm going to moderate for about the next half an hour some questions. Um, so Jack Tucker's asked some questions. Um, and the first one is for your excellency to start and then if anyone else would like to come in. How will the UAE develop and secure domestic sustainable aquaculture production? And um, how much of a role do you think RAS will play in food security for the UAE? So two questions. Thank you so much, Louise. Okay, so aquaculture, as I mentioned in my presentation, is a sector that we feel has great potential. But there are some fundamental things that we need to do to actually grow a sustainable aquaculture sector. So we are now, so we have a hatchery. Uh, it's very important when you grow an aquacultural sector that the, the inputs that you need for growing fish need to be there. We're having to ship everything from abroad, the juveniles, it just makes it very unsustainable. So we're looking into now the hatchery will soon operate this year and we'll be looking also to uh, grow local species. And it's also our role to market these local species on how we can best, uh, let's say, use them for sushi or, or other uh, tasteful seafood dishes. So, for example, uh, we have a, a local cobia, uh, which I like to call the black salmon. I mean, salmon is the number one fish being uh, eaten here in the UAE. But imagine we could market our local black salmon, the cobia, uh, in this region to actually then push more local sustainable uh, aquaculture. So uh, looking at hatcheries that are growing local species, um, ensuring that we have a fish feed mill. And here as well, as you know, the whole fish feed um, industry is also one um, that needs to be look at, looked at more in terms of how we can look at alternative, let's say, um, inputs for the fish feed meal to make it more sustainable. So looking at algae, and the UAE really has the right ecosystem to grow algae. When you think of the seawater and you think of the sun, uh, so looking at uh, sustainable fish feed mill, mills, and then also um, trying to get the youth um, to come into the sector more. So we do have, we've got about, I think, six, over 6,000 fishermen here in the UAE. Now the fishing industry here is very artisanal. So it's very much small scale fishing. We don't have the uh, commercial big scale fishing here in the UAE, uh, but we are a country that consumes a lot of fish. So we consume about 25 kilograms per person per year. And that is, well, I think it's nearly double the, the global average. So yes, we're looking at how we can ensure that across the aquaculture supply chain, we're looking at sustainability everywhere. And RAS plays a big role. We don't have the depth in, in our seas. So in the Arabian Gulf, we don't have that depth to be able to do a lot of sea cage farming. Uh, so for us, RAS systems looks like the better way to go. But it, it's really exciting to see some of the technologies that are happening in the sector. Um, on, and uh, we're looking very much into it. And that's why the Marine Innovation Park, which is something we hope 
to be launching soon will be kind of that go-to place um, when it comes to looking at technologies and aquaculture. So, so I've got a follow-up question for Tariq. We're seeing some systems now with controlled environment um, agriculture, where there's a combination of horticulture and aquaculture. Do you see developing your model over time to include both? Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, we we are looking into numerous different ways. Uh, I think one of the things that um, is, uh, 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 I mean, the the first part of you know our our thesis is we want to make this uh, for it to be sustainable. It needs to be um, economically um, uh, affordable um, as as a business, which means more people are attracted to to provide that. So. So one of the um, kind of key elements is how does that translate? Um, we, uh, for example, when we, I won't go into horticulture so much, but I, just to go through the idea of how we think about things, right? For it to be sustainable, it needs to be, uh, it needs to have an economic impact that is that is sustainable. Um, and and part of that is, you know, when we look at what is the right deployment of the right technology for where we are. Um, like uh, with what we've been able to do with regards to you know the capturing of light where we believe that the greenhouse um, uh, perspective and hydroponics is you know as, as part of what we do with the climate uh, controls that we have um, that, that, that enable that but um, you know there's some applications like when we talk about vertical farming right um, where we have this abundance of light. We don't need to use the artificial light where we, we use a hybrid of those technologies. And, and therefore, you know, adding horticulture into that is, is, is a possibility so long as it, it, it makes a, a economical sense for us. Um, and we're at the moment testing quite numerous um, different technologies that will provide that. Um, we've started with the tomatoes in our current pilot farm. Um, we're expanding that, um, but we do see that uh, happening uh, in the future as well. Lovely, thank you. And I'm going to follow on now with um, Dr. Chowdhury, building on that really. Um, in in this, this question alone, we've talked about the wide range in skill set that's needed, both for graduates and the workforce. And one of the questions that's come in is, how do you think the UAE can build that skilled workforce for aquaculture specifically? Yeah, it, it's a very relevant question as, as a follow-up question. Uh, we, in our most recent business plan for the college, the 2021-2023 business plan, uh, we have included aquaculture and fisheries as a full-fledged program. Mm -hmm. And we are developing it, and hopefully we will be able to launch it either in 2022 or 2023. Mm -hmm. And we will be seeking collaboration with international universities to be able to deliver it to the highest quality. So that will be one mode by which we will be able to create the workforce over here. The second approach that we plan to use is with the help of micro-credentials. And by micro-credentials, I mean uh, diploma programs for people who can come and on-site uh, get training for a couple of months, but also get online training uh, to be able to learn the basics and then come over here and get on-site training over here. So uh, a six-month to nine-month diploma program is in the making, and we would like to get a lot of farmers to bring down over here and use our excellent uh, aquaculture and fisheries lab that we have and uh, that way create a, a different type of workforce which is more entrepreneurial in nature and are able to start their own farms. The purpose of these micro-credentials is that people who are interested uh, get first an online training, then an on-site training, then training with uh, uh, hatcheries or aquaculture facilities uh, or places like the Marine Innovation Park, where they can go and learn more. That way they can develop their credentials and start their own business. So there are two fronts that we will be targeting in the coming years. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to move on to, we've had two questions um, from Tim and Emeka that are asking about food waste um, and also plant waste. So Emeka's question is around 
how going forward the UAE, both um, at the policy level, but also at business level, are going to look at food waste recycling utilisation and also how Pure Harvest itself is looking at how it deals with plant waste. So if I could come to Hela Excellency first. Sure, um, sure. No, no, a very good question. Food waste and food loss is a, is a huge challenge. Um, um, I'm just going to give you some data as well from our side. So food worth, and I've done the calculation for you, uh, one billion pounds sterling is, is wasted every year. And this is about, uh, we can say 25% of the food demand. Uh, so it's, it's a huge number. And it's one we really have to think of when we do, uh, when we think of our circular economy policies. Um, we have, as I showed you in the national uh, um, food security strategy, we have strategic direction alone on food waste and food loss. Uh, we are working on a, a national policy for this. Uh, Food Tech Valley uh, is also going to be looking at uh, things like insects, uh, using insects to break down food and then use that, um, uh, reuse the food or have then another protein source. Um, there's also the um, how to turn waste into compost. Uh, so really looking at how we can use waste as a resourceful or as a resource for further uh, nutrients and as well. Um, we're now seeing a lot of campaigns taking place at the retail level uh, on fruits and vegetables. I don't have to be perfect at their call. Like I don't have to be perfect. So people know that just because it doesn't look perfect, it still tastes the same. It can be used for the same purposes. Um, I actually do a lot of campaigns as well through my social media on what to do with food waste, use it in your smoothies, use it, uh, take it to the food banks that we're actually seeing sprouting now in the UAE. We have a lot of food banks now um, um, coming up and just helping the community uh, to give them a means of where to take their uh, their foods. And, and I really think, and I, I always say this, Louise, to all people I speak to, we need to look at ourselves first. Mm -hmm. um, uh, all of us, I think, are, are guilty in some way or another of throwing away edible foods. And uh, it comes down to really us thinking about, uh, can we actually uh, try and challenge ourselves? Can we actually go for a month without putting any edible food in, in the bin? Um, I, I, I try myself, I put a lot of effort in doing it, um, but because we are blessed with what we have, it, you really have to think about it and you have to get your whole household to think about it and the kids, need to grow up understanding that this is a precious resource. And, and I always say we need to start with ourselves. Uh, policies uh, will come, um, but I think the most powerful tool is um, really to uh, understand or incentivize how food waste can be used for as another, as another input for something else. And there are some great ideas that are coming up now, um, whether it's uh, dried foods, um, whether it's uh, taking foods and making it into a, a paste or jams or what, whatever it is. I, and I just think it's just a means of putting that effort to plan better. And um, I believe that through the pandemic now, people are actually more open for this kind of thinking and uh, taking care of food waste. So we're, we're using this and we're actually looking into launching hopefully a national movement into trying to get everybody to go towards uh, zero food waste um, as we should thank be. you my poor children always had to eat up the fridge day <laughs> which was a weird <laughs> concoction of food um so um i'm going to come to Tariq, but we've also had um some other um questions as well um so how do you deal with plant waste but how do you take into account the product life cycle when you're doing your analysis on say carbon and the carbon content of the physical infrastructure of the farm? Um, so uh, I think uh, first I'll handle how do we handle plant waste. Our current facility um, does produce some plant waste, we, um, especially when you consider that the life cycle of a tomato um, vine crop, um, which is the, the, the key you know, element of, of, of waste that is created is actually um, 
you know, it, it lives for about 40 weeks, 40 to 42 weeks. Um, uh, and, and therefore, at the moment, um, the infrastructure to be handle, uh, to, to handle that plant waste is still not available because the scale for that requirement still doesn't exist. However, as we start to develop that, there, there will be, uh, you know, especially, I mean, this is, a, the current farm is, is a very small farm, but it is something that we've considered um, with the expansion plans into looking into alternatives that handle that. But honestly, right now, it has not been um, a, a focus area um, since we, simply because our volumes are quite small with regards to the waste that is produced from, the, uh, from planting itself. Now, going into the second part of that question, which is how do we look at the, the kind of the, our infrastructure? One of the, the key strategies that we've done at the moment to, to produce this infrastructure, we actually are importing quite a considerable amount of the, 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 the physical um, uh, structures. Um, we are looking into localizing that as well uh, as, as part of our strategy. Um, now, uh, in, uh, and we're talking to people like uh, local con constructors to, to, to look at how they can produce the steel that's required to put in, uh, into that. Uh, same thing with regards to the glass and our glass requirements in, uh, you know, in that. Um, and, and also looking to develop uh, different things locally that are actually uh, a part of the infrastructure that we, that we build. But uh, for us to also become a sustainable growing industry in this part of the world, we not only need to look at how we produce the, the, the fruit and vegetable, but really how we construct as well, because a big part of what we do is the infrastructure um, uh, the, um, and the kind of the carbon footprint of creating that infrastructure as well. Um, we work very closely with, with regards to um, you know, being very close on the on the water side with uh, recirculating that water, looking at the right fertilizers that actually are able enabling us to use less water and less fertilizer as well um, as an input cost. Um, I, I think one of the things that enable us is the kind of the the, the financial diligence that we look into really enables us to look at this from, from that perspective. And a lot of these um, elements enable us actually to have a more sustainable, financially attractive um, solution. And I think your business models highlighted that whole concept of sustainable value creation and how you combine economic value with um, environmental value and social value too in terms of nutrition. And I think it's really interesting to see how the models are developing around that and what it is to, to deliver sustainable value. So thank you. So we have another question from Tim um, and this one I'm going to ask Dr. Chowdhury. Um, Tim um, has got very engaged with your word tickle and how you tickle youth. Um, so um, he's asked not only yourself, but others as well. How do um, agriculture has the word culture in it? How do you believe um, that we promote the culture aspect of agriculture um, as it changes over time. So Dr. Chowdhury. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was listening to the word tickle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's uh, I, I've been in, in so, so many different uh, cultural environments in Europe, uh, in, in Sweden, Denmark, Budapest, uh, and then in USA also. And there is a gradual decline in uh, the, the youngsters to really take up agriculture as a profession. And I've seen this for the past 35 to 40 years. And, and the one thing that I feel very strongly is, is that we need to keep on changing the landscape according to the future needs and then posing the problems to the youngsters, then they get excited that, okay, we will be interested in solving this problem which has got huge relevance on us as well as the entire humanity. So agriculture per se might not be very interesting, but if, for example, uh, her Excellency has uh, used this word agri-tech, which is very attractive 
to a, a number of, of uh, youngsters thinking that, okay, I'm not just being a farmer, and I, I'm not saying farmer in a, in a negative way, but farmer in, in a very positive way. I'm myself a farmer. Uh, that transition from a farmer to an agriculturist to an egg tech person, that itself changes the mindset. And it is all about changing the mindset and exciting the youth to be a part of a very important need for humanity, which is food. We need food on a daily basis on our table. We need to make our younger generation aware about it, that how important it is. As I said in my presentation also, a lot of us take food for granted. We don't look into the back mirror and try to see how it was produced. Uh, and, and it is an abundance. Truly speaking, it is an abundance. So we need to create mechanisms by which we can attract this younger generation to take up agriculture. And that's where technology comes into play a lot. At the same time, it has to be discovery oriented. It has to be innovative. It has to provide solutions to local problems to begin with, but with implications that are global in nature. Just to take an example that over here in UAE, the questions that are being asked regarding agriculture are different than the questions that are being asked in Holland or in Australia or in Korea or in England regarding agriculture. Now we need to excite our youth and tell them that these are the really uh, uh, difficult issues that need to be tackled. Some of them were highlighted by Tariq. Uh, when, when he said that, you know, these are the constraints and these are the solutions. And technology really excites the youth to find those solutions. I call today's youth as the iPhone generation. Uh, and and they, they need to do things on, on uh, where, where technology really makes them see that it is going from point A to point B. So that, that, that's, that's behind that. And, and we need to change that culture. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, before I come to Her Excellency, we've got another question which sort of ties in with that. And that is around the fact that um, as you develop technology, you also create vulnerabilities. And a lot of the uh, work I do is not only around food security, but food defense as well. And we've seen during COVID in Europe, a lot of um, potential malware attacks and attacks on um, the uh, digital aspects of food production. Um, with the cult looking at the culture of uh, food production and education, do you think as part of your food valley, there'll also be a cyber aspect and developing those cyber skills as well for people working in the agri-tech sector? Is that for me, Louise? Yes, yes. Yes, sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're kind of, as I mentioned, this is going to be a playground. So um, you're going to have people looking into things like the software programming. Uh, people will be looking at the different seeds. People will be looking at all, as you said, I mean, cyber security is a huge um let's say a huge sector or it's an aspect of so many sectors that we have to look at. So definitely um, this is something that's going to be looked at because every, I mean, just if you ask Tarek, um, who is the CFO of, of Pure Harvest, they need to make sure that their whole uh, programming and that no one's able to hack into what they're doing. I mean, there's this IPs involved in it. There's uh, a lot of knowledge and know-how um, which has to be uh, saved. I mean, at the end of the day, anything related to food, you are, um, yeah, you are contributing to the life of someone. So uh, this is definitely an aspect that I think Food Tech Valley will be looking into. Um, we're going to be looking in so many fields, also on things like post-harvest technologies, uh, looking at logistics, um, looking at um, also the inputs of, of agriculture, looking at novel foods, new foods, behavior around food. So there's going to be a lot of things uh, there. Thank you. And, and Tariq, that whole um, 
aspect of developing a skilled workforce um, across for anything from cyber through to uh, technology to understanding plants and how they grow. Um, how do you see yourselves as a business um, driving that agenda? Um, the way that we see this agenda, to be honest with you, is that there is actually quite a massive opportunity and we're really at the cusp. And the reason I say that is uh, we're, we're, we've started with just growing fruit and vegetables and creating this controlled environment um, you know, space uh, with this R&D facility. But if, if I think about it, all of the complementary parts and inputs that go towards that, there is a massive amount of opportunities that I kind of uh, highlighted a little bit. But, you know, one of the things I'm very proud of um, is that we're, um, and this goes to what Dr. Chowdhury was talking about and her ex excellency was just talking about as well, which is we are now requiring a, a, a very um, specific skill set of people to, to work at our farms. Um, you know, the agronomists that are, um, who we call growers inside our farms. Uh, we've, we've hired our, our, our first Emirati uh, female grower at our farm, which we're very, very proud of. Um, and, you know, we're, we're creating those opportunities for people to come and contribute. But on top of that, it's not only about people contributing to us. There's a lot of inputs, whether it's you're, you're talking about the seedlings, the, the roots, stocks that we're, that we're utilizing, a lot of the technology that we're building or incorporating, um, a lot of the software that we're, we're, we're developing, there's, there's actually quite a network around what we're building. Um, and, and, and there is a lot of opportunities be, behind that. Um, and this means that there is also complementary skill sets that will also follow um, in terms of what is required. Um, and as we grow that um, more uh, economically, we, we, we will be able to kind of um, bring a lot of these inputs into being locally produced. And actually, hopefully at some point in time, it could be things that we actually export out from this region that was never a leader necessarily. We've been a leader in, in, in food trade, right? Um, but I think there's a lot of our understanding and, and knowledge and you know exportability um, that we can provide once we start to bring this all in and, and start to really understand how to handle a, 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 a harsh environment but um, uh, going back to your point um, there's there's a lot to be done um, but uh, I think we're really only at the cusp uh, of this uh, opportunity uh, is the way we see it from an economic perspective. Louise, if I, if I may add to what Tarek just said, and really I can say, I mean, Pure Harvest is one of the, I mean, I've seen their, their journey when I started, when they were struggling to get their first funding here from the Innovation Fund and where they are now, and they're expanding now to Saudi Arabia, to Kuwait. And this is a true example of how UAE is now exporting knowledge and technology. So, and this is exactly what, we're trying to do here. And you know, when I talk to the youth, I, I tell them, I'm, I'm not looking for the next farmer, I'm looking for the next agri technologist. And this is, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to instill in them is that this is now a new era for agriculture. We're trying to entice the youth because the, unfortunately, when people think of farmers here, they think of hard work in the sun, plowing in the soil and we're trying to excite the youth to, to look at this with different eyes you love technology you love food you also are trying to also uh, yourself look at more healthier options uh, you want to make sure your kids are are having the best uh, um, or access to to the best healthy foods so wouldn't this excite you if you could grow food in your home or in your city and just be close to your friends and family and do it all through your devices? I mean, this is how I get them excited about. It. So I, I feel we need to kind of rebrand um, um, ag tech and, and uh, try and move to a, a cooler name to get the youth to become more excited about this, this the future of, of agriculture. Um, absolutely. And um... I, I think now has never been a better time for young people to see yes. a whole range of careers um, in agriculture. Um, 
our time is gone. An hour and a half has just flown by. Um, and so can I um, thank um, the three contributors today, um, um, Tariq, um, Dr. Chowdhury and um, Her Excellency for your presentations, but also um, how you've answered the questions. Um, and um, well, I've really enjoyed it and I hope the panelists have too. So thank, thank you. you very much. And thank you very much, Louise. I hope um, we get to do this again. Thank you. Thank, thank you all and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.